Well, good morning. We're so grateful that you're here today and really thankful that we had the opportunity to gather together in worship. Uh, if you're a first time guest, welcome. My name is Peyton and I have the privilege of serving as pastor of this congregation. And we're just really delighted that you're with us this morning. And so we have a gift that we wanna get to you after service. And so once service is over, I wanna encourage you to go out into the back foyer through those back uh, doors. If you're upstairs, you'll need to come down. If you're in the front, you'll need to go all the way to the back to the welcome table. And there will be someone there smiling to give you a little gift, just our way of saying thank you for joining us this morning. Well, any time that we get to gather together is a special opportunity, but any time that we get to gather together and kick off our time together by celebrating baptism is a really special opportunity. Uh, baptism is a beautiful picture of the gospel when those who have turned from sin and put their faith in Christ come and show to you and publicly profess their faith in Christ and identify with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And so in both services this morning, we have people who are coming, having repented of sins, turned to our faith in Christ, and are making that faith public through baptism. And so, so excited that we get to celebrate this morning. And so church family, would you put your hands together and welcome Ellie Cook as she comes. Ellie, do you know that your sins are forgiven because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Yes. And Ellie, will you seek to follow Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Well, Ellie, because of that, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, church, it's always exciting to celebrate new life in Christ. And so we're thankful for Ellie and we're thankful for what the Lord has done in her life. Well, let's continue to celebrate the gospel of Jesus together by standing to our feet and let's lift up our voices to King Jesus together. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, how wonderful in my soul
days are finally here. There's a sense of restoration, of hope and purpose in our state. Rebuilding, renewal, revival. The past year has taught us much about our faithful God. Through it all, Alabama Baptists have been at work shining His light in the darkness. The Great Commission ministries that benefit from the Myers-Mallory State Missions offering have been steadily meeting spiritual and physical needs across the state and beyond. Would you join in earnestly praying for these ministries during the week of prayer for state missions and prayerfully consider giving sacrificially to the Myers-Mallory State Missions offering? Your gifts help to reflect the light and the love of Jesus Christ to those who need Him most. Well, this month, our church has the opportunity to give above and beyond our normal tithes and offerings to give toward our send offering goal of $80,000. And one huge aspect of this year's 2021 send offering is our Myers Mallory State Mission offering. When you give to the send offering, much of your money will be sent just down the road to the Alabama Baptist State Board of Missions, where your money will go toward church planting efforts here in the state of Alabama. Your money will go toward partnering with Alabama Baptist missionaries who are living among the nations of the world. Your financial giving will go toward partnering with the WMU, the Women's Missionary Union here in the state of Alabama and much of your finances will go to partnering with Alabama Baptist Disaster Relief. As soon as Hurricane Ida took place recently, we had Alabama Baptist volunteers make their way into the heart of the storm to be there to, yes, cut down trees and to help provide relief to families, but also we've sent chaplains to pray with and to encourage those who are facing crazy devastation. Just as we think about the people within our church who even today are not with us because they're serving down in South Mississippi and South Louisiana, caring for those victims, we're reminded that we, as we sit in this room, are able to partner with them through our financial giving. This week, we had the opportunity to not only to give financially to the send offering, but we also have the opportunity to pray. I want to encourage you this week to look for opportunities to pray for our state missionaries, some of whom are faithful members of our church. Pray for their ministries and pray that God would continue to have his hand upon Alabama Baptists as we seek to minister to those within the boundaries of our state but also as we seek to send Alabama Baptists out of our state 
to offer care and to share the gospel with people around the nation and around the world. I'm grateful that our church for decades and decades have been partnering with other Southern Baptist churches in the state of Alabama. We can do more together then we can do a part. And so I want to encourage you to give generously so that we can give more to the Myers Mountain State Mission offering as a church than we've ever given before. Over the last handful of years, as this mission offering has begun, every year we have given more than the year before. And I want to challenge us to do that again. Already, church, you've given over $20,000 toward our sin goal of $80,000, which means we're a quarter of the way there. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being sacrificial in your giving. But I ask and I beg that this morning you will continue to give so that we can continue to bless people within our state and outside of our state through our partnership with the Alabama Baptist State Board of Missions. And so this morning, before we continue to sing, I want us to take some time to pray. I want us to pray that God would bless our partnership with Alabama Baptist, that he would do a work in our state that only he can do, and that he would do work in our state that would cause ripples throughout the nations for his glory. And so let's bow before the Lord and let's pray together. Lord God, we are so thankful that you have called our church into existence by the power of your gospel. And Lord, we thank you that the calling on our life is yes, salvation through you and you alone, but also through partnership with like-minded believers. Lord, we thank you for the partnership that we enjoy with Alabama Baptists. We thank you that through our financial giving and through our prayers and our resources, that we're able to plant churches across this state, like the church that we're planting in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, like churches that are being planted in Montgomery, Alabama. God, we praise you that we're able to partner with them through our giving and through our prayers. We thank you for the global partnerships that we have because Alabama Baptist churches are not just giving and praying, but they're sending missionaries to the ends of the earth. Thank you for those faithful men and women that are living among the nations, even now in the midst of the COVID pandemic, sharing the love of Christ and proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Lord, I thank you for the partnerships we enjoy, and I pray that you would use our giving to bless them even more. I thank you, Lord, that we're able to partner in church revitalizations, helping those churches that struggle mightily, especially in the pandemic. Lord, that you use our prayers and our giving to bless and encourage. Thank you that we're able to partner with WMU. And Lord, through their incredible ministry of resourcing churches and through training churches to live and to give on mission. And Lord, we thank you for those within our Alabama Baptist churches willing to partner for disaster relief. Lord, to step into the storm, to step into danger, to step into turmoil, to bring physical relief, but also to bring emotional and spiritual relief through the prayers and the sharing of the gospel. Lord, we pray for our church members who are there even now serving. Lord, we pray that you would use them mightily. And God, I pray that you would use our giving to continue to advance the cause of Christ here in our state, but through our state to the ends of the earth. Oh God, we praise you for the partnership we have with the Alabama Baptist State Board of Missions. And God, we pray that you would increase our giving to the sent offering so that we may partner with them all the more. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you have not left us alone because God, you are with us, but you also have left us brothers and sisters, not just here, but across this state that we get to link arms with And so God, for that partnership, we praise you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and continue to sing. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you discern this for Jesus your King? There's power. 
Let me invite you to take out your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Yesterday, in addition to enjoying a beautiful fall here in the state of Alabama, in addition to watching college football, I'm sure, like many of you, my family spent some time reflecting and remembering the tragedy and the horrific events of 20 years ago yesterday on September 11, 2001, when four planes were hijacked, two of them flown into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, one flown into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and one through the heroic efforts of the passengers of one of the planes, rather than flying probably into the White House in Washington, D.C., a crash in the fields of Pennsylvania. And over the last few days, I've been reading articles and I've been watching documentaries and and just thinking and talking with my wife and with others on our staff about the heaviness of those days and, and about how in a period of a couple of hours, almost 3,000 lives were lost. And as I've been watching these documentaries and and thinking through the events of that day and my own fear that I felt as as a high schooler, uh, knowing that we were at war and that I could be drafted in in just a couple of years, knowing that fear and thinking through that, um, I, I remember the heroic actions of the New York City Fire Department and all the first responders. I remember the heroic actions of men and women who decided that they would join the U.S. military in order to go overseas to fight for the causes of freedom and liberty. And what I've noticed has been said for 20 years now is that the firefighters and the police officers and and that the paramedics and that those in the military, rather than retreating from danger, rather than running away from harm, Rather than trying to escape devastation, instead, they ran into the darkness. They ran into the devastation. They ran into the danger zones at the risk of their lives so that they could rescue and so that they could draw people who are perishing out of the rubble and bring them so that they can enjoy life. And and as I've been thinking simultaneously about 9-11, And about the text and the topic that we're looking at this morning, I can't help but to think about the parallels between September 11, 2001 and the Christian church's call to evangelize, to share the good news of Christ, to proclaim the message of Jesus with the intent to draw people toward faith in Christ, calling them to repent and believe and to think about how a faithful Christian church who desires to see people come to faith in Christ, to receive forgiveness of sins, to avoid eternal conscious torment in hell, and to experience eternal life with Christ, how if we're going to be faithful, we too are going to have to be willing to run into the danger, to run into the darkness of people's lives, to to run into the rubble and to run into their situations so that through the power of the gospel, we might be used by God to draw them out of the darkness so that they may experience eternal life. So this morning, we turn our attention to the topic of evangelism by looking at Acts chapter 5, beginning verse 12 and reading through the end of the chapter. And so let me invite you, if you're physically able, to stand to your feet as we read God's perfect word. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, thinking about the church participating in faithful evangelism. 
Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand of the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. Now when the high priest came, those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. And God exalted him at right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, Take care of what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew some of the people after him. But he too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men... And let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer for help. Almighty God, we're so thankful for your word and we're thankful that through your word, we can know you and understand you and seek to obey you and worship you. And so God, we pray for your help. By your spirit, open our eyes so that we see your glory revealed in the face of Jesus. Open our ears so that we hear the voice of Christ calling forth from this text. And God, by your spirit, open our hearts so that we would worship properly and so that we would obey according to this word. For the glory of Christ and for the good of our church, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. We're looking at the characteristics of a gospel church, of a church that has been transformed by the message, the proclamation of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And a church that comes together, having been transformed by the gospel, is a church that's going to devote themselves to the word. They're going to read the word and they're going to submit to the teaching and preaching of the word. A gospel church is going to be devoted and committed to biblical community. 
of gathering together in large groups in corporate worship, but also in small group settings to love one another and pray for one another and encourage one another and serve one another. A gospel church is going to be committed to ordinances, uh, baptism as we celebrated this morning already, that, that declaration of faith in Christ and that entryway into the church family, but also the Lord's Supper, that family meal in which we come together, breaking bread to be reminded of Christ, drinking the fruit of the vine to be reminded of the shed blood of Christ. A gospel church prays together because we realize that what has given us new life, what is provided forgiveness of sins is nothing in us, but it's all from God. And we come to him and full on dependence and reliance saying, oh God, there's nothing we can do apart from you. And so God, what you do when only you can do. But all this is what the church does when they gather. But when we look at the early church in Acts 2, we find in Acts 2, 47, that as the church went out, Day by day, the Lord added to their number because day by day, as they were scattered out, they continued to proclaim the message of Christ and call men, women, boys, and girls to turn from sin and to trust Christ alone for salvation. They participated in the act of evangelism. And if we here at First Baptist Prattville are going to be a gospel church, then we're going to be an evangelistic church. If we're going to be a church that talks about Jesus all the time, then we better be a church that goes out of these doors talking about Jesus all the time. If we're going to be a church that lifts up our voices to proclaim the gospel of Christ in song, we better be a church that goes out of these doors proclaiming the gospel of Jesus to our neighbors and our coworkers and our friends and our family members So I believe that this text gives us four essential exhortations for a gospel church. This is a narrative text, and so not everything in this text is necessarily something that we're to follow, John and Tittle. But as a narrative text, I do believe that there are some principles that a faithful gospel church designed to be faithful on mission, sharing the gospel and evangelism, are going to follow. First, if we're going to be faithful in evangelism... We've got to display gospel change. Notice in verse 12 that signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. These signs and wonders were being done so much so that we're told in verse 15 that even the sick were being brought to the apostles to be healed. The Lord Jesus, during his ministry on earth, had healed the sick. He had raised the dead. He had given sight to the blind. But before he had ascended back to his father, he had given his apostles, not everyone, but his unique special messengers, this power to heal in order to validate their message. Now, we don't have this ongoing miraculous power to where we can simply touch someone and they're healed. We can't simply have someone brought into our shadow as Peter could and have a blind person receive their sight. But what we do know is that we have a record of this miraculous and that when we join together and pray in unison, that God often chooses to do what we can't do, humanly speaking, only what he can do, but he lets us partner in that. And they were coming together, we're told in Solomon's portico at the end of verse 12. They were gathering outside the temple. They were no longer going into the temple in order to make sacrifices because they had trusted in Jesus as the ultimate and final sacrifice. But they were gathering outside of the temple in this area known as Solomon's portico that was like a big patio that was the only remaining portion of the original temple built centuries prior by King Solomon. And they were gathering outside at this point, thousands of them, to submit to the teaching and to the praying and to submit to coming together to encourage one another. And as they were coming together, notice that no one would dare join them because they were such at all at what the gospel had done to these people. These people no longer felt the need to go to the temple to offer sacrifices. 
these people no longer felt the need to perform some of the Jewish rituals. These people have been so transformed that even healings and miraculous signs are being taken place. But not only that, but there was this incredible purity and holiness. We didn't read it, but in the first 11 verses of chapter five, we learn about this man and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, who, who sell their belongings, which sounds great, but then they lie about how much they sold and they keep back some for themselves and God takes the life of both of them. And having heard about the way that this God takes sin so seriously, and how this, this new church takes sin so seriously. How that they don't just join together to kind of do the rituals. And they don't just join together to go about the motions. But they're seeking to put sin to death and to live holy, godly lives. No one would dare join them. But notice it says, but they were all held in high esteem. And the Lord added to their number. It was through the holiness of the church. It was through the power of the church. It was through the gathering of the church that people outside of the church were able to see that there was something unique and different about that community. And it attracted them to receive and to, and to investigate what that might be. And that led them to faith in Christ. If we want to be a faithful evangelistic church in which we see people in Prattville and the River region coming to faith in Christ, we cannot neglect our own pursuit of holiness as a church body. We have been called to be a set apart people. Israel was placed in this specific land and they were told that they were to look different than the nations of the world. The nations of the world would, would bow down to false gods made with human hands and false idols crafted out of wood and stone. But Israel was to be unique. They were to worship the one true God. That the, that the nations of the world would, would, would divorce and intermarry and have all types of sexual exploits. But inside the church, there was a holiness code. That outside the people of Israel, there was to be slander and lying and dishonesty. But inside God's people, there was to be a holiness and a honesty. So that through this unique, special people, the nations may come to believe that there was one true God. And then... The course of the Old Testament, we find that over and over and over again, Israel fell back on their requirement to be God's unique, special, holy people. So God rejected them, which in many ways is good news for us who are not Jewish because God has grafted us in, but the church of Jesus Christ is no different. Just like God's people have always been called to be unique and different and holy, we have been called to be people who believe the gospel of Christ, but then we allow by God's spirit and through the word to be changed by this gospel so that we don't look, talk, believe, and act like everyone else. It's in our holiness that we're able to lift up a positive affirmation of Christ. It's in the way that we behave as neighbors. It's in the way that we behave on Facebook and Instagram. It's the way that we talk to one another. It's the way that we display the change that's, that's happened in our hearts and in our lives that people begin to see and long to be a part of that kind of community. But also it's important if we're gonna be a faithful evangelistic church, that we've got to expect consistent uh, resistance. Notice that as this holy community of faith, this, this people that have been affected and changed by the gospel, as they have been gathering together and as they've been scattering to preach the gospel, the high priest, Caiaphas himself, along with his group of Sadducees, they rose up against the early church and they were jealous 
They were jealous because of the power of this message that they were preaching and the power of this message to transform this community. And so they arrested the apostles and they put them in public prison. This isn't the first time that they've been arrested. In fact, in the text we looked at last week, speaking about prayer in Acts 4, we find that as they were going out sharing the gospel, that the council threw them in prison then as well. And they warned them, don't preach and don't teach and don't talk about the name of Jesus. And as we continue on in the book of Acts, you'll find over and over and over, there were threats made by officials and rulers and governors and religious leaders saying, don't talk about Christ. You can't talk about Jesus. At the end of Acts 5, after all this is done, they're going to be beaten for the name of Christ. And I'm afraid, if I can be honest, that we, as a wonderful nation of people, have had liberty and freedom so long that we think that we as Christians ought to be able to stand up and preach the gospel anywhere and everywhere we want and everyone give us a standing ovation for it. But if you look at the New Testament, And if you look at the history of the church, consistent, that means ongoing, resistance to the gospel is to be the expectation. You cannot be faithful in sharing the gospel and telling people that they are dead in their sins and there is one way to be saved through a formerly dead, now resurrected Middle Eastern man named Jesus and not occasionally be resisted. That can't happen. It is not possible for you to go into a pluralistic society and tell people that there is one way. It is not possible for you to do that and not be opposed. And I realize that we enjoy lots of freedoms in our country. And most of us have never gone to jail for preaching the gospel. Most of us have never lost a job for sharing the gospel. Most of us have never been fined for proclaiming Christ. But most of us, if we're honest, act like, well, we can't share the gospel or we'll lose our job. Have you ever tried them on it? Most of us talk like, "Um, we can't talk about Jesus and our our place of work. And and again, as we're going to see later, the apostle said, we must obey God and not man. If you were a Christian, that means that you have confessed that Jesus is Lord. And do you know what that means? That means that he is king over your life and over the whole world. And you don't get an option when and how to obey him. He is either king and he gets to tell you what to do or he's not. If we're going to be an evangelistic people, if we're going to be a church that turns this city upside down, then we must expect resistance. And rather than trying to be a people known and beloved in the community, and maybe we will be, maybe we should be a people known for we love people so much that we're not willing that they should perish. But like those firefighters in 9-11, we'll walk into the darkness and into the danger and we'll testify to the rescue that's available in Jesus and Jesus alone. If we're going to be a faithful evangelistic people, we're going to share the gospel and you're going to lose friends. They're going to be neighbors. They're going to shut their garage door when you drive up. They're going to be people that aren't going to want to sit by you at the football game. But is Jesus worth it or is he not? If he's worth it, then we should be willing to follow him and pick up our cross and die to ourselves die to our opinions and die to our comfort and die to what people think about us and live for the one that we will spend eternity with. But also, we need to continue faithful proclamation. Notice in verse 9, 19, excuse me, that they had been thrown in prison, but an angel of the Lord came and brought them out. And this angel, this messenger from God tells these men to go right back preaching and teaching about the life. 
the light, the one through whom life is found. This angel is sent, which is really ironic because it's the Sadducees that actually threw these men into prison. And the Sadducees were known within Judaism of only affirming the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They didn't believe in the resurrection and they also didn't believe in angels. And so God comes and delivers his people out of prison through angels as if God wants these Sadducees to know, well, you can believe in them or not believe in them, but they're real and watch me break my guys out of prison through them. And notice that what they do, they, they could have got out of prison and they could have ran for cover, right? Uh, they could have gone home. They could have crossed the border. They could have got out of Dodge to be safe. But the early church wasn't concerned with safety like sensitive American Christians like me and you. The early church cared more about obedience than safety. And so they did exactly what God through the angel told them to do. They went back to the temple and they preached. Now, let me just be clear how bold this is. Not only do they know that eventually the the guards are going to be sent by the council, as we're told they were, and they're going to go to the prison and they're going to find that they're not there. And so they're going to ask around and find out that they're back preaching and they're going to get in trouble again. Not only that, but notice the location they're preaching. They're preaching at the temple, which for you and me, we often think, oh, well, that sounds safe enough. They're preaching at the church, but that's not what they're doing. They're preaching at the Jewish place of worship and they're preaching a different message. They're saying, you Jews believe that you must offer sacrifices day after day to be forgiven, but we're here to tell you that the final sacrifice has already been made. His name is Jesus. You Jews believe that a high priest one day a year can enter into the presence of God, but we're here to tell you that Jesus is the high priest and through him, we all can go into the presence of God. It would be like you and me going to a mosque and standing on a concrete block and proclaiming what you Muslims believe is wrong. Christ is king. He is the son of God. He did die and was resurrected. These are bold men who are willing to put their lives, their reputations on the line. They're willing to be opposed to remain faithful in the proclamation. And so, of course, that's what happens. They're preaching the gospel. The council sends for the guards in the morning. They find that the prison is still locked, but the men are gone. And so finally, somebody comes in in verse 25 and says, Look, the men whom you put in, in prison... They're teaching the people in the temple. They're talking about Jesus. So the officers, they go and grab these men again. And once again, they drag them before the council. And they begin to have a, a conversation with the council. And the council says, we told you to stop talking about this Jesus. You see, the council's concerned because they thought that when they killed Jesus, this man who claimed to be a king over all kings, and when they killed this Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah, they thought that that would be the end of it, that those who followed him, that they would just fizzle out. But it hadn't. This group that began with only a few has now multiplied to thousands and they're beginning to panic. And so now anyone who's talking about Jesus, they say, look, he's gone, but you can't even say his name anymore. Didn't we tell you not to mention him? But Peter, verse 29, and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Peter and the apostles provide us an example of what it looks like in your workplace when you're told, hey, don't talk about religion. Well, are you gonna obey God or are you gonna obey man? When you're told in your neighborhood, hey, we don't really want you talking about Jesus anymore. Well, ask yourself, are you gonna obey God or are you gonna obey man? 
Now, I'm not asking you or even encouraging you to be foolish or, or to do something silly. You've got to provide for your families as God has called especially men to do. But the fact is, I think most of us living in central Alabama, I think most of us use that, well, I'm not supposed to as an excuse. And we've actually never even tested anybody on it. What does it look like for us to be a people so in love with Jesus, so zealous and bold for the gospel of Christ that we're ob- willing to obey God rather than man? And notice what these men say in verse 30. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. These are Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection. But Dr. Luke, writing the book of Acts, makes it crystal clear that when they preached the gospel, they hammered the resurrection. They could have said, well, Christ died and left it there. They could have skipped the part that the Sadducees really get agitated about because they think it's ridiculous to believe in a guy who died and now is raised. They they think that's dumb. But they said, oh, God, our Father, raise Jesus. He came back to life. They're saying the very thing that they know is going to anger these men, not simply to anger them, but to be faithful to the call of God to proclaim the message that brings forth life. And he says, God has has allowed him to die. You hung him on a tree. He's raising to life. And now he's exalted him and he is leader. He is king, not you. Caiaphas, you're not the boss, he is. You don't get to tell me how to live and what to do, he does. He is my savior, not you. You didn't shed your blood so I can be forgiven, but he did. So so I'm witness of what he did and who he is, and we cannot but help speak about him. Are we in the midst of resistance and opposition going to speak the name of Jesus. When you're uncomfortable sitting at a table with unbelievers for lunch, are you able to say, friends, I always pray for my meal. Would you pray with me? And is there anything I can pray for you about? And as you pray, you pray the gospel. Oh, Christ, thank you for coming. It's through you and you alone that I can be saved through your death and resurrection. What does it look like for you to invite your neighbors, knowing that they may think it's awkward, but over for a cookout and halfway through the cookout, you say, our family always reads the scripture at night together. Would you mind if we do that? And would you do it with us? And you intentionally choose a passage of scripture that proclaims the gospel. What would it look like for you at the water cooler or at the coffee pot in your place of work? Or when you're working out next to someone at the Y, what would it look like for you to say, Hey, are you a follower of Jesus? Can I tell you about Jesus? What would it look like for you to seek day after day after day to be faithful rather than fearful? But lastly, if we're gonna be an evangelistic church, we gotta trust God's plan. Notice that as it seems that these men are about to be harmed even further, when they're enraged and they're wanting to kill them, verse 33, that a Pharisee named Gamaliel stands up. He's a teacher of the law. Now, this is ironic because the the Sanhedrin is made up of, yes, Pharisees and Sadducees, but the deck is stacked way on the side of the Sadducees. Caiaphas, the high priest himself, is a Sadducee. The Sadducees and the Pharisees hated one another. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law. The people loved the Pharisees because they wanted to know how to be right with God. If we need to do this, we'll do that. We just need to make sure our sins are forgiven. But the Sadducees were in partnership with Rome. The Sadducees uh, were were kind of the go-between between the people of Israel and between the Romans that occupied Israel. And the Sadducees enjoyed the fact that they had power, even though the people didn't trust them. And so the Sadducees and Pharisees were really rivals because they disagreed about the Bible. 
Sadducees believed there is no resurrection. The Pharisees believe there is a resurrection. The Sadducees believe there are no angels. The Pharisees believe that there are angels. The Sadducees believe that there is no such thing as miraculous. The Pharisees believe that there is miraculous. The Sadducees were in cahoots with the Romans. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do with the Romans. And yet in the midst of a Sadducee-led group of people, a Pharisee stands up. And he begins to say, don't you remember that in the past there's been people that have risen up and they claim to be something, but eventually they died out and all their followers did too. And so in verse 38, he says, let these people alone because if their plan is of man, it will fail. And if it's of God, it will succeed. Now here's what's even crazier. That in God's good providence, he is using a Pharisee who, oh, by the way, is also the tutor of the man named Saul of Tarsus, who will eventually become the greatest theologian and missionary of the church. This Pharisee to begin to grant wisdom to this group of Sadducees. But not only that, this Pharisee gives terrible wisdom. That ain't true. That if it's of man, it will fail. When it's of God, it will succeed. That's not true. Because there are plenty of things of man that in the world's eyes seem to succeed. The fastest growing religion in the world is a false religion, Islam. In, in man's eyes, it sure does seem like it's succeeding as millions are converted to Islam every single year. Is that of God? Absolutely not. There are plenty of false gospels being preached. There are plenty of buildings and people that call themselves churches that aren't actually proclaiming one way of salvation. There is plenty of so-called earthly success. And so he's not even given good wisdom, but they listen to him. And God's providential plan, he allows a Pharisee who the Sadducees hate to give really bad wisdom and they listen to it so that they release these men after giving them a beating. And these men are charged not to teach and preach the name of Jesus anymore. And as these men leave in verse 41, they leave high-fiving and belly chest bumping that they had been chosen by God to be opposed and resisted for the name of Christ. And notice verse 42, and day after day after day after day after day after day, they did not obey what the council had told them to be silent Instead, day after day after day, they kept obeying Jesus and teaching and proclaiming that the Messiah has come, that the new kingdom is here, and the king has arrived, and he has a name, the formerly dead Middle Eastern man born in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth. His name is Jesus. They didn't stop because of opposition. They didn't stop because of the warning. They kept on out of faithfulness and adoration of Christ, teaching and preaching the name of Jesus. They trusted God's plan. They knew that the worst thing that could happen to them is that they would be killed. But to depart from the body is to be present in the Lord. They knew the worst thing that could happen is what would eventually happen to Paul and Silas. Uh, They could be thrown in prison. But in prison, they'll be unbelievers there and they'll just keep preaching about Jesus. They trusted God's plan. And though in this situation, God allowed them to be delivered and God allowed them to go on preaching, we know from history that eventually Peter was crucified, just like Jesus. That John was boiled alive and then exiled while burnt and calloused to the island of Patmos where he ended his days alone in prison. We know that the rest of these apostles were martyred, some sawn in half, some losing their heads. But out of faithfulness to Jesus, 
they kept teaching and sharing and preaching. And so if we're going to be a gospel church, we're going to love the word. But the word is going to send us out to share the gospel. If we're a gospel church, we're going to come together. And the reason we're going to be a biblical community is we're going to have to encourage one another because outside those walls, there's war. We're going to come together and we're going to, we're going to participate in baptism to be reminded that though we're rejected, it seems like 10 out of 10 times as we've shared the gospel that God still saves people. We're going to break bread and drink the fruit of the vine together to be reminded, oh Christ, you're still allowing us to live, yet you were broken for us. The worst that could be happened to us has already happened to you and we're united to you. And so the worst that can happen is we get to be with you. We're going to pray together and we're going to say, God, would you use our meager efforts at evangelism to grow and advance your kingdom? We're going to do all this because we see ourselves as a gospel church who lives to know Jesus and to make him known. So what does that look like for you? What does that look like for you as an individual, you as a family, you as a Sunday school class, us as a church, to be a gospel people who desire to testify and witness boldly, zealously to Christ, no matter what it costs us, because Jesus is worth it. And today, if you're an unbeliever, please hear me, that this Christ who has sent us out to share the good news, he sends us out because he was first sent to us to die, to absorb the punishment we deserve and to be resurrected so that all, including you, who turn from sin and trust in him alone can and will be saved if you will simply declare him as king and Lord and savior. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would do a work in our church so that we may continue to sing and talk about Jesus here, but so that we may be compelled to talk about Jesus out there. Lord, create within us an evangelistic culture to where it's not just one or two faithful gospel sharers, but that we, the whole church, see it as our privilege and our responsibility. And for those among us who have never yielded to King Jesus, I pray right now that they would see the beauty of Christ who is willing to die for them, who is willing to be placed in a tomb for them, who was resurrected for them so that they can come to faith in him. Oh God, would you save them today? And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. In a moment, we'll have pastors available to talk and counsel with you. But for now, let's stand to our feet and lift our voices to King Jesus. Come every soul by sin on us, there's mercy And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you. Thank you for gathering with us this morning as we worship. Again, for those of you that are guests, thanks for being here. Don't forget to go out into the foyer and receive the gift that we have for you. For those of you who would like to talk with the pastor, maybe about becoming a Christian, uh, maybe about, like Ellie, following the Lord in obedience to baptism, maybe you want to talk about linking up with our church, or, or maybe you've got questions about how to share the gospel. Uh, we'll have pastors available up front in a moment. I'll be in the back for you. We would love to talk and, and encourage you this morning. We also want to celebrate that we do have a couple who have come having placed faith in Christ, and today both are being baptized. Ellie was baptized here at 9 30. Taylor will be baptized at 11 o'clock. That means that they have turned from sin, they trusted Christ, and now they're identifying with Christ and with our church. Let's put our hands together to celebrate them.
And let me just say to you, while we keep their pictures up there, I, I just want, I want to encourage you because I know that there are many of you in this room that are faithfully sharing the gospel. And I know that it can be discouraging when it seems like most people tell you no, or they're, they just don't care, or, or maybe that's not right for them. But I just want to remind you, when you look in the eyes of these two, that God still saves people. And so be encouraged. We, we sow liberally seeds and we ask for God to bring the growth. And so be encouraged today as you continue to live faithfully and trust God with the results. Let's be reminded that we're a great commission people and let's recite the great commission of our Lord Jesus together. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's seek to live day by day this week faithful to God's call on evangelism.